Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and I am so excited that you're here to catch the weekly replay of my laid-back yet very inspiring conversations with other full-time professional artists. The purpose of this series is to show aspiring artists that it is completely possible to have a great career in the arts. And if you ever want to tune in and have your questions answered in real time by myself or featured guests, then just check out the schedule over at facebook.com slash groups slash Artist Academy every Tuesday to catch us on live. I'll see you there. This episode is sponsored by the Artist Academy Advanced Membership, a program for artists who want to up-level their art game by taking it from a hobby or a side hustle to a full-time six-figure art business. With weekly trainings that include step-by-step proven art business techniques, plus painting tutorials from yours truly (laughs) and other guest artists who are masters in their field, you will be well-equipped to learn and grow into the highly skilled and highly profitable artist you know you're meant to be. I've figured out what it takes to build my own six-figure art business, and now my heart is set on teaching aspiring artists like you to do the same. It's not hard, but it does require your time and dedication. So if you're up for the challenge, go to advancedmember.com. That's advancedmember.com to learn more. This week's episode features sculptor, potter, and painter William Jeffrey Jones. I could listen to William and talk about his stories as a sculptor all day. Like, did you know that he used to sculpt the figurines of famous people like Shaq, Magic Johnson, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the list goes on. And when you purchase one of these figurines at Walmart, if you look at the very bottom of the box, you'll see William Jeffrey Jones on the label. How cool is that? He is full of tips of how to be a working artist from his many years of experience, like this tip. Have you ever put a mirror up to your art to see it in reverse? Have you ever taken a photo and flipped the image to see the reverse so that you can see it with completely new perspective? No? you should try it. It's a whole new way to look at your art to know if things are exactly as they should be or if they're a little off. He shares many more tips like this, but I'll just let you hear them from him. So let me know what you think of this week's episode with William Jeffrey Jones. So glad that you have agreed to come on and be interviewed. I have so many questions, mostly because I'm just a painter. I have no idea how to sculpt and do pottery and any of that. I took a class a long or like in college six years ago for pottery, so I understand how hard it is and I sure. respect it. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I, I was a, a painting student, I wanted to be an illustrator. Um, and I took the clay class, and holy cow, it was a whole game changer. It changed my complete paradigm, um, and so I was hooked in clay. This was 1983, mind you, <laughs> and I was hooked in clay, and they couldn't run me out of the, uh, the, the clay studio at the time because um, at the time, my f- a couple of my friends and I, who were, both, who were all art majors, we were renting an old office building downtown in Joplin, Missouri. And so we had this space that we used as a painting studio. And we paid like $100 a month for this huge space. And so we were painting every night, but I didn't have a a clay facility. So I hung out at the, the college for hours and hours and hours during their hours during their open hours, and then afterwards, we would paint until dawn, and then uh, go to Spanish class oh, uh, at eight o'clock in the morning, and get on with our college days. So. That's so fun to be in that kind of co-op atmosphere, though, and like feeding off oh, everybody else's creativity. Yeah, and that's kind of what I've created here now at my own studio. It's kind of that same feel where you're 
uh, bouncing ideas off of each other and kind of inspiring each other. The same with the community. We're, uh, we can talk more about that later, but um, I'm from a small town in southwest Missouri, and uh, after being out in the world uh, working as a professional artist, I decided this was really home after all. So I moved back here about 15 years ago, and over two years ago, my wife and I purchased a little coffee shop uh, here in our little town, and I set up my clay studio in the back of that building, uh, the back part of that building, and so now we have a coffee shop. It's called The Clay Cup, A Coffee Pottery, and so people can come and take classes with me and my assistant, Kathleen, who's here, by the way, um, she was my intern about two years ago, and I've just kind of coaxed her along. Now she's making a killing doing what she's doing. Um, so, but it's exciting to be surrounded by people I've known like my whole life, as well as um, other people who are coming in and getting motivated to learn and to, uh, to, uh, to create themselves. That's amazing. So you mentioned you lived like a lot of other different places and now you're in o Ozark or where exactly? I'm in the Ozarks, okay. which is a region of the United States. It's southwest Missouri. Uh, I live in a town called Neosho, Missouri. Neosho. Okay. Some people know where Joplin is. Mm -hmm. It's in the southwest corner. Um, Kansas City is up here. Joplin is right here. Yes. And Neosho is right there. I'm in... I <laughs> I'm in Springfield, so I'm right here. There you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Well, yeah. now, yeah. So I worked at the Silver Dollar City for a number of oh. years. From 89 to 96, I was a production potter there. So. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know if all of your viewers know what Silver Dollar City is. If not, they um, should. It's like what, what we all did as kids. <laughs> oh, yeah, since, well, I was born in 1961, and we were going to Silver Dollar City in the early or the late 60s. Oh, really? So, I had no yeah, idea it, it was around that long. It was. I think it opened in the mid 60s, early 60s. So uh, there wasn't much to it back then. It was like a train, and a candy shop, and a, uh, a blacksmith. No, no roller coasters. <laughs> No, the train. The train was it. Yeah. <laughs> that was <Okay>. huge. <laughs> awesome. So what do you think was the tipping point that took you from hobby to professional artist? You mentioned you went to school for it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I thought about that. I, I don't know. I mean, I was born into a DIY family. Ooh. And so, you know, <laughs> being from the Ozarks, being from Missouri... We're all about the DIY. Everybody uh, knows how to do something. I was raised in a wood shop. My dad was a, an accountant, but had a wood shop. And so I learned how to uh, build things from the age of three or four. And so I never really thought of having a career making things because I studied in high school. I studied all the math and science courses, physics, trigonometry, calculus, uh, chemistry. And I thought I was going to go into like engineering. Um, I was offered a scholarship to Cornell in chemical engineering. Um, I turned that down because I didn't want to make shampoo for Johnson and Johnson for the rest of my life. <laughs> but uh, long story. Um, but I decided my senior year of high school that I wanted to be an artist. So I was going to go study art. And that's, so that's pretty much what I did. My parents were, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Skeptical, hmm. maybe. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a mild word for uh, the way they felt. They were just like, well, okay, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, that, that's exactly how my, my parents were. Cause I, I was majoring in business here at Missouri state. And I was, I remember calling and be like, Hey, I'm going to switch my major from business to art. And they were like, great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> same. That's the same with my, uh, my assistant. She got a BS, a BFA at Missouri Southern. And, um, her parents were like, you know, Oh, okay. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And then, 
And then she came on with me, and they were just like still kind of a little skeptical. And now they're like, like great, we awesome, we support you, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, because my parents really didn't know what I could do for a living other than teach. And so it's a shame, but something that I need to tell people um, is every single product in a Walmart was designed by an artist. There is a huge, huge number of careers out there in art, and you just have to get with it. Uh, make art, express yourself, but at the same time, um, I use the musician analogy. Um, jazz musicians, they play scales, they practice eight to 10 hours a day at these technical things, and then they can express themselves when they get on stage. And so that's the way I always felt I wanted to learn as much technique uh, to, to get my skills as, as, uh, as good as I possibly could be. And my motto is, I'm twice the artist that I was but I'm not half the artist that I plan to be. Oh, I love that. Always learning. Always, always. I'll never be as good as I want to be because I keep raising the bar. Yeah, I love it. So how many hours do you typically spend um, creating nowadays <laughs> versus back then nowadays? Well, for a long, long time, um, I would work 12 to 16 hours a day. And, you know, it, out of necessity, also because that's my compulsion uh, to just create or to be working with my hands and my brain that many hours a day. Now, uh, if you were really to um, define the time that I spend creating versus the time I spend doing business or publicity or any number of other things in, in uh this town, I only really get in four to six hours a day, even though I work from, say, noon until 2 or 3 a.m. Yeah. every day. Actually, and that's re really interesting. Can you talk about that? So when I, uh, when I asked you to be on the podcast, I was like, hey, how's like 10 a.m.? And you're like, that's actually really early <laughs> for me. And I'm like, oh, I that's love it. That's like this. my 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm also a night painter. So you mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit. How did you, you know, because a lot of people, they have this just like sense of like, if you get up at 5 a.m., you're like the productive person and stuff. And like, that's like the thing to do. How, I mean, I love that you just own it too. You're like, nope, this is my, my time is at night. Yeah, I mean, there are so many people that are creative people who are nocturnal. Mm -hmm. um, at any given time, in the middle of the night, at 2 or 3 a.m., I can call or text my buddies on the East Coast who are sculptors or painters or whatever, they're still up. So they're still <laughs> up at like 3 or 4 a.m. doing what they do. It's because, and I've been a nocturnal since I was in the crib, so my mom will tell you. Yeah. Um, so that's just kind of my cycle is late at night. Um, but there's nobody else up to bother us. Mm -hmm. There's no phone. There's no, I mean, some people are texting, but the people who are texting us at 2 a.m. are ones that we want to talk to. Um, <laughs> so that's not that big of a deal. But Kathleen, my assistant, she's also an, a night person. So, but interestingly, I mean, we leave the studio at an extremely regular time every night, say between 2 and 3 a.m. I get in bed religiously at around 4 or 4.05, 4 4.10, somewhere in there. So I go to bed more regularly than my wife, who has a day job. Um, and so I explain that to her. You know, she complains about me coming to bed at 4. It's like, look, I come to bed within five minutes every night, <laughs> yeah. every single night. That's just my schedule. So yeah. it is what it is. You but found something that works for you. We get so much done. Well, and now having the studio uh, and the coffee shop, um, when we're not in social distancing, um, I don't know how many people come in, dozens of people come in all day long to talk. Uh, I love it. Uh, that's why we set this thing up yeah. is so that people could come in. But uh, the mayor, city councilman, uh, city manager, 
all kinds of people on all kinds of committees with the Chamber of Commerce, etc., come in and visit and talk uh, about ideas or what they want to do um, or what they think I might like to do. So um, people want to talk about classes or just hang out with the potters and the artists at the Clay Cup. It's very cool. It's a very cool environment. But um, I can't get anything done during the day. <laughs> I bet not, man. I wish Neosha was just a little bit closer. I would just pop in. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that far from you, which is just, yeah, annoying just enough. Um, we go to Nixa to pick up clay maybe once a month or so, once yeah. every, every four to six weeks. Um, I've been getting clay from L&R Specialties in Nixa since the uh, mid-'80s, so... Oh, pretty wow. funny. I love it. Uh, we have a question right here, actually. Someone mm -hmm. asked, uh, have you experienced inspirational block when you can create, uh, and how do you fight inspirational block? I never have. I never? Oh, I like that. <laughs> I never have, and I don't, uh, because, but that's a great question, because I, I, I think I would encounter it, maybe have encountered it in the past, but the thing to do is when you are inspired the most, when you, when you have this energy and you just feel it coming on, roll with it and sketch and draw all your ideas mm -hmm. and think organically or laterally, I call it. Um, start making one idea branch into 10 more ideas and then 10 more ideas from each of those ideas. Don't just go with one single idea and think, oh, I can't, I can't make this work. Think way outside of that idea or branch off of that idea. And then you'll just keep branching and branching and branching. And pretty soon um, I end up with a stack of paper this tall of ideas that I want to work on. And I can just go back through that thing uh, and select an idea that I want to work on. And then while I'm working on that, my brain will move into 10 other derivatives of that idea. So, um, man, once I get on that train, it's hard to stop me. That's yeah. why, you know, sometimes the sun will come up while I'm still creating. Yeah, I, I love that you just said that too, because like for the past couple of nights, I was like kind of, I was not really a block block, but I was just like not feeling super inspired. Not that we have to feel inspired all the time. And just you saying that, of like, hey, think of 10 different ideas. I'm like, that's a really good idea because <laughs> I like have an idea, but just thinking of all like a series of what, what I could do that I think, yeah, that's going to help me especially a lot. Sure. And you know, one thing that helps me, I can't draw in sketchbooks. I shut down. What? It's too precious. It's too nice. <laughs> oh. I don't know. I don't want to put something bad in my nice sketchbook that I have. It just looks so nice. So I draw on computer printing paper and I keep it like, huge boxes of this stuff, reams of this stuff, and I just draw on that uh, because it's throwaway paper, so I'm not worried about having to draw something that's super nice, and I can just, I mean, my, my sketches to myself are going to be like, I'll show you. I mean, they can be like that. <laughs> yeah, like just So a with a ballpoint pen, of all things, um, so I can scribble and sketch with that i'm limited to i can't erase this thing but um that just helps me to get my ideas down yeah i love it awesome i'm going to start with that literally after we get off this i'm just going to start writing down all these different ideas okay so uh can you talk us through your creating process like i know that there's a whole other process to you know, clay making and all that. What's, what's your, do you have anything special that you picked up through your years of experience? Um, let's narrow that down. Okay. What do you, ha, ha. so like, um, with, with your process with making like a clay pot, um, is there anything, is there like a specific way you've decided that you like to do it or do you kind of follow the book on stuff or do you create a lot at once? Um, what do you think? Um, uh, Okay. Um, I usually work with pottery. I usually work in series. So I will make, I don't, I don't like making just one of something in pottery. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I'll sit down and make half a dozen. If they're nice pieces, I'll try to make four to six pieces that are similar. Um, if they're production pieces like mugs or bowls or casserole dishes, things like that, um, I'll try to make 20 to 30 to 50 of that one thing. I have a client coming in today talking about making a uh, hundred small plant pots for his business. Oh, wow. uh, my assistant, Kathleen, um, she's making these, these little uh, thread bowls that she's designed. They are to hold this Voldani um, silk thread bobbin that all these quilters use. And she's selling, how many of you sold to those? Six or 700. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So, so she sits down and she'll throw 30 to 50 of those in a sitting. Wow. So, um, and when you're doing that, your brain goes off to think, this goes back to that question that, that uh, a viewer had about inspiration. While you're doing that, your brain is really taken off. It's thinking of all kinds of other things that you'd rather be doing besides sitting there making mugs or bowls. Uh, and so that's where you jot things down really quick. Um, but another thing that we do while we're doing production stuff is listen to, um, I mean, we listen to jazz a lot because it's, it's a creative, it's a very creative um, music form. And you're listening to artists make things up as they go. And so that's kind of an inspiration in itself. But we also listen to audiobooks or science and economics podcasts, believe it or not. So Ooh. economics is a big part of what we think about because that's business. That's if you want to be a professional, you know, mm -hmm. you study business. Yeah. So that's a huge part of actually making it as an artist. And I know I'm skipping all over the place. I'll no, come back to great. my process in a little bit. But um, I learned early on, like in the mid 80s, right out of college, that I would rather work as an artist as work as a assistant manager at the clothing shop mm -hmm. on the mall. Yeah. I would rather work as an artist no matter how hard that was to get going, but that way I would be paying the bills at the same time I was learning um, and learning my craft, learning how to navigate business, uh, how to survive as an artist. So I think it's kind of a um, trial by fire, if you will. If you're going to do it, do it. Yeah, for sure. If you're going to do it, do it and learn all the things and just learn as you go. Dive in. I mean, first. some people don't have a choice. I mean, I didn't have kids and I didn't have a wife. So um, I was, I mean, I was single for all intents and purposes until about 20 years ago. So and I'm 58. So, um, you know, I was single almost until I was 40. Oh, wow. So I didn't have, and I didn't have bills. I didn't have like debt to speak of. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could travel the world. I could do all kinds of stuff without kind of uh, feeling an obligation to, to a family or to a wife or kids. So I bet that helped so me. Freeing. Yeah. It is, but it's a choice. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what this is all about is you make choices. And if you're going to make this choice, then that's going to affect your other choices that you make as well, or the other, the other options that you have laid before you. Yeah, for sure. It's always about, like thinking ahead too. It's like, if you, if you learn this thing and you can go in this path and stuff and yeah. And make, and make no mistake. It's all a trade off. I mean, I traded off oh, yeah. learning uh, and working as an artist for a family you know, I chose to go the artist route as opposed to the responsibilities of having a family. So, yeah, yeah to, to each their own. But now you have an amazing career that you love and you love to go to work every day. I'm like, that's hard. Oh, to yeah. There's no part of this um, that I don't love. There's, there's small aspects of it that I don't like. Yeah. Um, kind of. 
Um, and I won't say what those are because there are going to be people around who are like, no, I thought you loved us. Um, <laughs> no, it, it's all, it's all good. But, um, I love to come to work and create. And one of the things that we don't do, uh, in the clay cup studio is drama. Don't bring it. Just don't bring it because it just <sighs> kills the mood for everybody. So if, if you have problems, we all do. We all have psychological issues and everything, but I want this studio, what I try to, to uh, make sure of is that my studio is kind of free from drama, if you will. That's kind of, I kind of leave that stuff at the door. Uh, but as a business person, you kind of have to deal with things on a daily basis. So um, it's, a, it's definitely a balance. Yeah, for but, sure. No, no, no drama, no crying kids in the background, no any of that. <laughs> or politics between people. And I'm not talking about politic, government politics. I'm talking about pol political drama between people, uh, disagreements, anger, upset about something, about some minor thing or some heavy thing. Uh, just kind of like to leave that at the door when I come and create. That way I can get down to business or do what I need to do. Uh, because I'm so, I'm so backed up with things that I need to do, like commissions and things like that. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not swamped with these amazing commissions. Sometimes your, your bread and butter comes from pieces, from things that you uh, don't necessarily want to do that badly. But that's your bread and butter. And that's what teaches you discipline, for one thing. To have discipline is, is probably one of the most important things. Um, but also, taking on these jobs that are things that you wouldn't yourself think of doing is a challenge. And that teaches you skills and teaches you things about yourself that you wouldn't learn otherwise. Let me give you an example. So for uh, in 99 or 2000, I took a job as a staff sculptor for McFarland Toys. And so I had been sculpting for some collectible figurine companies and some architectural ornament companies also. But um, I took this gig with McFarland Toys to sculpt action figure prototypes. And I'd been doing that for a little while for other people, other companies. But I took a full-time job, a salaried job, moved to New Jersey and work out of their studio there. But I sculpted uh, action figure prototypes for the Matrix movies, the Terminator <laughs> movies. Oh, my gosh, um, that's so cool. <laughs> so, but these are all, and sports figures like Shaquille O'Neal, um, Allen Iverson, Tim Duncan, all of these basketball players, baseball players, football players. That's nothing that I would uh, have selected myself. Hockey. I did hockey figures. <laughs> we did. We didn't watch hockey here. We're in Southwest Missouri. Hockey. <laughs> yeah, that's not a thing. So, so anyway, the challenge was to do this work that I would not have selected myself. But I was paid for it. I was a hired gun, if you will, hired to do this thing um, and directed by all these wonderful art directors who taught me so much about um, the craft the industry and myself, what I really could do. They pushed me like a, like a movie director. They pushed me uh, to give the best performance that I possibly could. And that was amazing. Um, that was, uh, let me see. So here's, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is a Buffy the vampire slayer that I did for the toy industry or a collectible industry after I moved back to my hometown. Here's the final piece. Oh, so cool. So, and you know, she's this tall. Mm -hmm. So, um, just a few inches detail out the wazoo. 
Yeah, that's so cool, though. Um, <laughs> here's, so, here's, so here's the Shaquille O'Neal figure that I did. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Make him taller than he actually is with that long arm. So, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> scale-wise, most of the figures, let's say they would be this big. Shaquille's figure in scale was like this big. So it was huge. <laughs> yeah, it was a huge a piece. <laughs> but, I mean, this is, this is, this is plastic. I sculpted the clay. Do you paint that them as well? I don't paint them. That's a whole nother job That's so, okay. uh, in that industry. So I was just uh, sculpting. You saw that green clay. This is a clay called Castelline. It's hard. It's like wax. You have to heat it kind of like jewelry. Did you ever do? Uh, I don't, no, I don't think so. Okay. Well, jewelers will work in wax to create the piece and then they will cast it, uh, make a mold of it and then cast it uh, in, uh, they will actually invest it and then cast it in silver or uh, fine metal. But this way, working in this hard green clay, I would get the clay done, get approvals from all the various directors, art directors, director of the movie, the actor themselves, um, the owner of the team, uh, the NBA, the NFL would all have to give approvals on my piece. Mm -hmm. Then it would go to mold making. They would make a silicone mold and then cast the piece in resin. That resin piece then goes to the model builders and the, then to the painters. And the painters paint it and then to the photographer. Then the photographer photographs it. Then the piece goes to Hong Kong. And they make the injection molds off of that. So, and then the companies that I worked for, they would uh, produce between 30,000 to 80,000 of each piece that I sculpted. So, you know, when the fine artists are talking to me about their fine art and everything, I'm like, are you kidding? I'm in every Walmart on, on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. That's so unique so, too. So here's um Okay, so here's a Resident Evil piece that I did. <laughs> but I don't know if you can see. Let me see where the camera is. Can you see where it says William Jeffrey Jones on the bottom? Oh, um Where? Yes, on, yeah, see. I see it. It's on the right right there. Yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> Look at you. So, so yeah, some companies that I worked for would give you credit for sculpting and some would not. So oh. it's a it's a good perk, that's for sure. Yeah. But the um the reason I'm not still doing that stuff in that industry is that I wanted something I wanted to build my own brand. I wanted to be William Jeffrey Jones or Jeff Jones. Mm -hmm. And so um I don't get any residuals or anything off of these pieces that I sculpted for the toy industry. Yeah. You get a one-time payment. Work for uh, hire, yeah. Yeah, just work for hire. Yeah. So I would get, I would get um, $2,500 up front to start the piece. And then when I was finished, I would get the other $2,500. Um, and then it would just be that, that cycle of just keeping on, keeping on. And I could work in three to four week cycles that way. Okay, yeah, so, so one piece took you th three to four Three weeks? to four weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. very cool. That's so, so crazy. That's so crazy to, ha to have on a resume too, to just be like, oh yeah, I did that. It's like, it, it gives you like automatic legitimacy. I have, uh, I have, and talking about resumes, your portfolio, if you're wanting to be a professional artist, I don't mean this in a bad way, your degree is useless. <laughs> yeah, it really is useless. Nobody has asked for my d diploma ever, 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 <laughs> ever. ever. <laughs> yeah. So especially if you're in the work for hire thing, if you're working professionally as an artist, um, they don't care. It's all yeah. about your portfolio. Your portfolio is everything. For sure. Okay. So let's move on here. Um, are there any art lessons you've learned the hard way? <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody kind of laughs when they when I ask this. They're like, "Which which one?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you mean? What's meant by lessons? Um, maybe like we people have said stuff in the past where they you know they've not 
you know, they've completed a project and then not got paid or, you know, they, oh. they lost a client oh, yeah. because of this. Well, yeah. Or... Well, that's just, some of that's common sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, everybody wants to work. Everybody wants to feel like a, they're legit, a, a professional artist. And so you, early on, you're taking jobs in kind of hinky circumstances. You know, it's like, okay, I'll let it slide. I'll do that job for $230. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that takes you know, me two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, and you don't get any money up front or whatever. Um, and as far as money up front, I'm... Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but it depends on the situation. I, can, I, I learn who the people are that I'm working for. If I'm working for the industry or, or manufacturing or something like that, I always get it up front. Or if I'm uh, painting a mural, something like that, or a big piece for a, uh, a business to go in their lobby or whatnot, I need money up front just so that I can get started because the panel I'm going to have to prepare is huge. Uh, I'm going to need paint. I'm going to need gesso. I'm going to need all that stuff. So I get uh, um, all that up front. That's usually on a short, small contract that I draw up with whoever the client is. Um, and then what I like to do is get, say, a third of the money up front and then a third when I'm halfway done. And then a third when I'm completed, if that makes sense. Because the, the half up front or the third up front gives me money to work on. And then when I'm halfway done, that money is usually gone. <laughs> yeah. So I need something to live on. And so that's where the next third comes in, the next draw, I'll say. And then, then I'm compelled to finish the piece so that I can get that last payment. So... What I do is I set myself up for these motivations to force me to finish the piece. That's good, yeah, because uh, it's tough. And, it's tough to finish. It's like the beginning's fun, the middle's not fun, and then the end is really fun. Yeah, exactly. Or or, or the end, you're, and we're always in a rush. <laughs> yeah. There's not a single one of us that isn't in a rush to be at a deadline <laughs> because stuff. Stuff. You yeah. know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but we're always in a rush, no matter what it is. But, um, you know, uh, get... And I had a lot of books about the business of art and so on, but I kind of learned along the way how I worked, how I best worked, and what motivates me, as well as... Um, and another thing that I... Sometimes I don't take money up front, because if I think there, I'm going to have problems getting it done on time or getting it done in a short amount of time um i won't take anything up front again depending on the client if i know them if i know their background um because i don't want something to happen and then i i owe them money if i can't get it done um if they're on a deadline if i have a strict deadline to do then yes uh, we're going to adhere to this thing legally down the line. But if it's just a, oh, get that done sometime when you get a chance, then I'm not charging them a, a, a fee up front because it may be a year mm -hmm. before I can get to it uh, with other things that I do have deadlines for. I know this is all. No, that, that's great. Yeah, like I, I, think, I think that's good. It's like if you want it done, really quickly like you got to pay for it you know if you can wait mm -hmm. then it's on my time like then yeah no that's exactly right like that's that. that's the perfect way to uh to describe it i like that okay yeah it's, it's like stuff you can work on on like ra rainy days and all that okay yeah so do you have a favorite past project this is hard <laughs> I know. because yeah. i mean if you i mean i have probably 120 pieces in my portfolio and that's maybe 1% of all the work I've done. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> gosh. I'm, I mean, I'm not kidding you. Um, the stuff that's on my shelf right now, there's like three sculptures in progress and I don't know how many pots okay. in progress. What, what, what's a subject that really lights you up? Like, is it like a, just a, a really cool vase? Is it like a, what's your favorite thing? If you could work on something right now, what would it be? <laughs> the female figure. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. So that I was kind of the go-to female figure guy in the toy industry too. Yeah. Uh, I'm. I enjoy sculpting figures. Yeah. Um, so if I have my choice of jobs, it's it's doing figurative work. I love um, it. Yeah. Just it's it's very. I mean, male or female, the human body. Let's put it that way. Um, I just love to sculpt people because I spent so much time doing it. When I was working with the toy industry, for years I was working 12 to 16 hour days working on these pieces. And I had to make them look like the people. And so you learn, um, you're forced to get good at it. uh, To not only express the figure itself but do it in such a way that it expresses the idea that the figure is supposed to be conveying the emotion that the the figure is supposed to be conveying uh with the the pose the um the uh, the energy of the piece you have to to take this piece of clay and make it look like something uh something specific Uh, and so that to me is a challenge. I, I love that. Um, so um, I would prefer to do that over just sitting down and making mugs and bowls. Okay. But I can sell way more mugs and bowls than I can uh, sculptures. So. I gotcha. Okay, awesome. I was not expecting that, but I love it. I personally do not really like to do people, but I have friends uh, who are artists that are just love to paint portraits and figures and just all of that. Once you, once you get it down, once you understand how it's done and how, how to look at your work, um, and this is a big part of it, you have to learn how to look at your work with fresh eyes or completely objectively. You have to learn how to look at your work um, through other people's eyes. And the, one of the best ways to do that is to look at your work through a mirror. And you should do this with painting, landscapes, anything. You have spent so much time staring at this piece that you're working on that everything looks right to you now. You cannot see mistakes. If you look at that piece in the mirror, holy crap, it's going to look like you're going to see all the mistakes. If you're doing a portrait, if you're doing a sculpture of a person, you're going to see that, oh, I've got... The, the axis of the eyes like this while the mouth is like this. <laughs> You'll see how it's asymmetrical and how you need to bring in the symmetry. So look at your work through uh, in a mirror or take f- pictures of it and flip it in Photoshop or whatever on your computer. Be able to flip it. Because if you just take a picture of it and look at the picture like it is, your eyes are still going to see it as it as they saw it. But if you flip it, holy cow, that's my piece. (laughs) And I'm I'm not kidding you. It's amazing what you'll see when you look at your work in a mirror. That's a, that's key. That if I had to tell somebody something big about a lesson learned, that's a huge lesson. Look at your work with fresh eyes and don't be afraid to get other people's honest opinions and don't, don't let them get away with like, oh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's real nice. That, yeah. yeah, wow. <laughs> no, tell me what you think of this. And then put your ego aside. Um, that was the one thing about working in the toy industry or working as a hired gun. You're getting criticisms from six different directions. It's not about you. It's not about your personality. It's not about what, you've, what life decisions you've made. It's about this piece right here. They just want it changed just this much. Um, and so don't be afraid of making those changes without being offended because they're not trying to offend you. They're just trying to let you know how they see it. And I think that's, that's huge. That's important. Yes, I love that. I love that so much because like, uh, in our Artist Academy group, a lot of people will put their, their stuff up and be like, hey, I really want feedback. And then like you can tell when... A, Ten, 10 different people be like to change this 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 and this and they're like okay thanks guys it's like, <laughs> and then you're like oh, okay oh. <laughs> yeah but wah, then wah. they do it and they change it and then it looks so much better and it's like oh, okay. okay so that's so that's that's something too i think it's important 
for people to show their work in public. Um, so if you go back to my Silver Dollar City days, I mean, I that's 89 is when I started work there. Um, you're doing work in the public's eye. The public is watching you do this. And so you have to learn um, to at least look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Because even that 10-year-old can tell that yeah, you're not very good. Kids <laughs> always tell the truth. <laughs> oh, my God. And so, um, so there, uh, thousands of people were watching me every day work, right? So you have to get good at it. Um, and you're selling your work to thousands of people every day. And so you have to make things that people want to buy. You're not just like, oh, I'm going to express myself in this idea and yeah. screw them. They don't know real art. Yeah. It's like, uh, you've got to pay your bills. You know? How are you going to pay your bills? So uh, maybe your, your art wasn't that good to begin with. You know? So I think it's important to uh, be seen in the public uh, after Silver Dollar City, I worked with manufacturers and things. And so, yeah, they're going to tell you because they're footing the bill. Uh, or they're the people that you brought to the dance or that brought you to the dance. So you need to dance with them. <laughs> yeah. um, do what they want you to do. But uh, for a couple of years, I was traveling the world doing exhibition sand sculpture for a variety of huge companies. And these are huge gigantic sand sculptures in shopping malls at sporting events city uh You've state fairs yeah. <laughs> yeah and that's where a lot of this comes from yeah. um but you're sculpting in front of people and at any second your sand sculpture could collapse so you're working feverishly to do this thing <laughs> while a million people are looking at you going you think that looks good <laughs> 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 I thought it did. <laughs> okay. yeah. But um, so you're working in the public eye. And so that, I think, forces you to get good at what you're doing. And now um, I can sit down in front of a million people or five people and work uh, without even thinking about it. Uh, sit down at the at the wheel and throw pots um, uh, and by the way, we have some festivals here. We've had to cancel some for obvious reasons, but we have some festivals in town where we put our pottery wheels out on the street in front of our coffee shop and block off the whole street. I'm going to talk to you about this too, by the way, um, later. We put artists out there uh, on display while we put our wheels out there. And so we're making pots in front of people all day long while people... Uh, from the whole area come and just party with us all day oh, so it's a fun. blast yeah. and so that's that's important uh, to be able to work in front of people because that forces you to be a better artist because at least you force yourself to not just sit there and think about something for 15 minutes because people are like hey chop chop do something you know make a decision <laughs> Yeah. Do something. So uh, it forces you to work a little bit faster, which makes your brain work faster. I think that if we just work in our own studios all the time at our own pace, we slow down and we don't accomplish as much as we could if we were, if a deadline or if, if people are watching us. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I love it. Okay, so I have one more question here. And, Absolutely. Uh, as many as you want. Okay, great. I, I could listen to your stories all day, really. Um, so is there any advice that you would give to artists who want to make art their full-time career if I don't know where to start with, with doing Oof. that? Man. <laughs> Loaded. Yeah, it is. Um, every, okay, there's not one way for everyone and this is this is tough because um, you kind of have to find your way into it. I'm not saying luck is involved, but luck is involved. <laughs> uh, um, no, set yourself on a path and go that direction and see where it takes you. But commit. 
um, to a path. Um, Ooh, I like that. Commit to a path. That's good. Yeah. I mean, and don't just be all mealy mouth and be like, oh, I'm going to wait until something happens or whatever. <laughs> go. Go. Open that door and go down it. Yeah. Kathleen just said, be fearless. Be um, fearless. And that's what she had to do. She was kind of, she had a BFA. And so she found out that uh, two years ago, I was looking for an intern. And so she had some clay experience. And so, um, but she had a degree. And I told her that that was useless when she came to talk to me. <laughs> so I said, I wouldn't hold that against her, is what I told her. <laughs> okay. so, um, so she came and talked to me, interviewed with me. And um, the third question was, does the F word bother you? Um, long story. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to see what she was made of, more or less, um, and if she could stand being around people and things like that. But um, tried her out, but she was scared to death when she came to talk to me about being my intern. And so I put her on the wheel, and she was terrified at that time. But <laughs> yeah. she was tolerable. Her, her skills were tolerable. They were straight tolerable. out of college kind of tolerable. <laughs> um, but um, then within months of working here 10 to 12 hours a day, holy cow, her skill set just ramped all the way up. And so she kept going and I told her, man, I think you're more than my intern now. You're my, you're more my studio assistant. I said, it doesn't pay either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but, and that was, a, that was an important thing that I was trying to get across her. And her parents weren't, they were like, wait a minute, you're working for this guy for nothing? And she's like, no, it's not for nothing. It's, he's teaching me about, the profession. He's teaching me these skills. He's helping me develop as an artist. And so I see the value in that. She saw the value in that. Yeah. And if I'd have had the opportunity to do this in my earlier years, holy cow, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Um, but then months later, she's helping me teach classes. She's uh, doing some of her own productions. She's selling her work. And now she's the she's the only one of the two of us that's actually making a killing making decent living right now uh, with her wholesale sales um, to shops and stores and uh, individuals and so she's doing and again I don't pay her but she has full reign of the studio the facilities she can use all of this she buys her own clay um, but we both work 12 to 16 hours a day, her doing her own production, as well as helping me teach classes and any number of other things for uh, the Clay Cup um, as kind of a pay it back sort of a thing. So she does this and this and this in exchange for studio rent and equipment use, uh, street cred of belonging to the studio, et cetera, et cetera. So, and so she's, she's the next Jeff Jones, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I love that. So, and this is how it works. And now her folks are like, we knew it all along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly how it is. That's so cool. But she, you know, she's super happy with what she's doing now. I mean, she was working part-time as a pharmacy tech at a local hospital and just miserable. Yeah. And now, you know, she couldn't be happier doing this. She's happy every day. She comes in with a smile on her face and she's like, oh, wow, this is life's good. Yeah. Life is good. I love it. Well, I guess that that's a pretty good wrap up to our interview. Uh, Instagram live will automatically uh, kick us off at like 101. So we've got okay. just a couple more minutes, but got it. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and all of your stories and we should do a part two here in like six months or something. Let's do it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we could do that. We could do it. You could come down ooh, ooh. to the studio. <laughs> My pottery skills are not good. No, no, no. We, we won't have to do that. <laughs> I could be on the wheel and we could just, you could just be. I, Let, no, let's do it. Let's put you on the wheel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, do, do you ever do like video stuff to, uh, to put online? 
Oh, sure. Oh, you, you do? Okay, yeah. You mean, like, when you say video stuff, you mean, like... Like, uh, online classes, basically. Oh, cl um, I haven't, but I wouldn't mind doing that. I have to figure out the logistics of all of that. I can help how you to with that. see <laughs> other people. Okay, yeah, let's talk. Okay. Let's talk about it. Definitely, But, definitely. you know, another thing, um, you have to come down and see... So we bought a, a big church building right across the street. And so we converted that into a music venue and an event center. And you got to see this like uh, late Victorian, low Gothic church building with all this. It's called Northwood Arts and Event now. So if you want to look that up on Instagram or Facebook. But I want to teach classes there. I want to do all kinds of art things there as soon as we open the state back up and we can all rub elbows again yeah amazing sounds great okay so yeah i'll i'll message you afterwards and we'll get together about how to make Definitely. those courses and you can teach me yeah, some let's stuff talk. too and for sure cool all right well thank you again so much i know that so, so many listeners are going to get so many good things from it the the podcast episode will come out one week from today and i'll email you all that info so yeah I'll talk thank to you, you so much see ya <laughs> This episode is sponsored by the Artist Academy Advanced Membership, a program for artists who want to up-level their art game by taking it from a hobby or a side hustle to a full-time six-figure art business. With weekly trainings that include step-by-step -step proven art business techniques, plus painting tutorials from yours truly <laughs> and other guest artists who are masters in their field, you will be well-equipped to learn and grow into the highly skilled and highly profitable artist you know you're meant to be. I've figured out what it takes to build my own six-figure art business, and now my heart is set on teaching aspiring artists like you to do the same. It's not hard, but it does require your time and dedication. So if you're up for the challenge, go to advancedmember.com. That's advancedmember.com to learn more. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. If you review our podcast and send a screenshot of that review to me on Instagram, I am at art by Andrea Earhart. I will then promote your art on my story and tag you as a little thank you for helping me grow this podcast and our Artist Academy community. I have a reach of over 50,000 on Instagram. So this is a little help me to help you incentive. Also, if you ever want your questions answered in real time by myself or featured guests, then just hop on over to facebook.com slash groups slash artist academy to check out the schedule every Tuesday to catch us on live. I'll see you next week.